The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to, Welcome today's. to today's POSMAC. Welcome Type to today's Health IT Safety Health Webinar. Health IT Safety Webinar Series. We're getting some double we uh, getting... feedback. Is that from the caption? I don't know. Uh, let's try it again. Welcome to the Health IT Safety Webinar Series. Next slide, please. Just a quick uh, few housekeeping notes. Uh, closed captioning for today's webinar is available at www.captionedtext.com. The event number is 266-4368. There will be questions taken at the end of each presenter's uh, uh, comments. And uh, please, Feedback if you have a question, write that question in the uh, question uh, box on your screen in the right-hand corner. Uh, slides for today's presentation are actually posted right now at www.healthitsafety.org. And I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Jonathan Wall. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, this is Dr. Jonathan Wald with RTI. Uh, I just wanted to uh, welcome all the attendees as well as the panelists to um, our eighth session um, from the Health IT Safety Webinar Series. Um, this is a series of 10 webinars that are focused on health IT and patient safety issues. Uh, they've been occurring monthly this year uh, and they will be wrapping up in September. Um, they're funded, the webinars are funded by the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. Uh, and they're being conducted by RTI International, which is a nonprofit research organization. And this is part of a year-long project to develop a roadmap for a health IT safety center um, for the ONC. If you'd like additional information, it's available at www.healthitsafety.org. Um, the roadmap was uh, recently released, um, so um, uh, feel free to go to this website if you'd like to, uh, to access information about it as well as about the webinar series. Um, and finally, the views of the presenters um, are their own and do not represent the views of RTI or the ONC. Next slide, please. So um, uh, today we're going to be uh, having a number of presenters and I'd like to introduce our moderator, Mark Graber, who's a senior fellow at RTI. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Mark Graber is a senior fellow at RTI and an internationally recognized authority on diagnostic error in medicine who founded the Diagnostic Error in Medicine Conference Series as well as the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine and the journal Diagnosis, uh, which is published widely. And uh, maybe we can go back to the previous slide now. And, uh, and Mark, you can uh, take it away. Thank you very much, John, and thank you, Michael, and welcome to everybody. Our topic today is health IT and clinical documentation, which is a hot-button topic for almost every clinician out there working with an electronic medical record. EMRs has solved the problem of the missing chart, but have created so many new problems in the process that users everywhere are somewhat dismayed and, and depressed, really. I'd like to read a quote from Bob Walker's new book, The Digital Doctor, that captures some of this frustration. Quote, computerization, which many had hoped would be a life preserver for the physician drowning in paperwork, has become an anchor. The process has transmuted the note from the patient's story into a bureaucratic monstrosity. So I don't know if it's that bad, but we'll find out today. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Gordon Schiff. Gordy is what my mother would say is a real doctor. He's a practicing internist. I uh, was at Cook County for many years, now at the Brigham. Gordy is the Associate Director at the Center for Patient Safety Research and Practice at Brigham and Women's Hospital. 
Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School and Safety Director of the Harvard Center for Primary Care Academic Improvement. His topic today is Clinical Documentation and Patient Safety, the Next Frontier for Better Diagnosis and Treatment. Gordy, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Mark. Um, and uh, I'm a bit challenged here. I'm calling from the Albuquerque Airport uh, en route uh, back from uh, doing some talking with the Indian Health Service uh, in Chinle and Gallup, New Mexico, and uh, happy to be here. Uh, if we could just advance to the next slide, or the first slide, really. Uh, there's a little bit of a delay. So what, what I want to cover in our uh, 25 minutes today is uh, really oriented around, uh, I guess, a format that's familiar, Chief Complaints Assessment and Plan. And uh, I, I really am wearing several hats here. One is some of the ones that Mark mentioned. I'm a HIT safety researcher and and person interested in, in safety and especially related to diagnostic errors. Those are several hats. But the hat I'm mainly going to be wearing today is just of a, a practicing physician, I guess, Mark. Uh, mother's uh, uh, description uh, aptly applies, maybe with a little bit of a windmill tilter as well. So I'm, I'm a, again, a very frustrated user in many ways, and I think that's what we want to uh, uh, capture and hopefully build on that. Uh, I'm a new Epic user, so our, our health system about uh, two months ago put Epic in place, and I, I guess I'm called a super user, but I would be very uh, embarrassed if anyone would think I have any special uh, uh, knowledge about EPIC or, or how to use it at this point, uh, and uh, you'll hear some of my frustrations and issues. Uh, I was a prior uh, Brigham uh, homegrown, the Brigham LMR, and then the Cook County, as Mark mentioned. I worked there for 30 years, and uh, the last few years we had Cerner as our uh, IT system, so I guess I have a little bit of a, of a cross-system uh, perspective. Uh, but uh, my, my, my HIT safety perspective really comes from looking at CPOE systems, and we've done a bunch of safety studies. And the question is, can we transfer some of these lessons? Hopefully we can, because we found issues related to CPOE that could be improved. We published some of that uh, work from the MPSF, funded that, and there's a, some new data coming out from an FDA study, funded study that we've done. And uh, again, as I mentioned, a lot of this really is, is my personal reflections. And, Frankly, this is a, a new talk. I'm just trying some ideas, and hopefully you all can uh, shoot them down or, or build on them or find them useful. So uh, this issues and ideas, I, I'd like to sort of go beyond the sort of usual complaints about the copy and paste and note bloat and increased work, although those are certainly front and center, and you're going to hear some of my feelings about this, to really talk about the, the real problem is the failure to re realize the potential of uh, clinical documentation and EMRs for quality, efficiency, safety, uh, better caring, communication among the care team, and really redesigning health care. And, and using the diagnosis here is in the area that Mark and I work together uh, in, in the Society for Improvement for Diagnosis to try to think about how to uh, uh, this, the clinical documentation is leverage yet. Next slide. Uh, so this next slide, and a slight delay in loading these up, I'm sorry, it talks about uh, uh, really where we've come from. This is really hard to believe. A quarter of a century ago, I remember when this book was first published and how exciting the potential and the promise of uh, computer-based patient record uh, was. Uh, another probably landmark was this high-tech uh, uh, adoption uh, of, of stimulus money and then the increased adoption, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. And where we've come to is really that this uh, clinical EMRs and clinical documentation has uh, taken on a central role in really much of what physicians and others' time involved. I'm going to be referring mostly to, to my uh, experience as a physician, but really most of this is equally applicable to uh, uh, certainly other uh, uh, clinicians practicing and, and also as an inpatient, outpatient physician, other uh, clinicians in the outpatient, nurse practitioners, as well as people documenting in the inpatient setting and, uh, and nurses and uh, physicians as well. Next slide, which really looks at uh, this incredible uh, journey that really now in the last, uh, we're just talking about the last uh, six or seven years, the uh, hot, and this is inpatient, but I think we see parallel trends with outpatient. This is from the ONC website. We've, data are regularly updated. As you can see, we've gone from a 
tiny minority of hospitals with uh, clinical notes, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine percent. So if you look on the right in 2014, and I'm sure 2015 would be even higher, uh, the vast majority of um, hospitals and presumably uh, clinicians uh, are, are now writing their notes uh, electronically. Next slide. Uh, so widespread frustration about notes. You can quickly go through these. Uh, oops. What what do we do here? Did we lose the connection here? I'm sorry. Something's happened. Here we go. Um, I, these are things that uh, I, I hear my colleagues and myself saying on a regular basis. Uh, I, I just want to finish my notes and move on to the next patient. Uh, this whole idea about trying to be finished with your notes before you're done uh, is almost an impossible dream for many of us. I want to come home at night and play with my kids and go to sleep and maybe even read some medicine so I can be a better doctor. Instead, I have to do my charting. I'm so embarrassed uh, that others have to read my notes. They are so bad, but I, have to, but I have to keep cutting more and more corners just to get them done. And is there one more bullet? Uh, and this, of course, is a very uh, familiar refrain, meaningless use equals meaningless notes. And uh, I, I think uh, all these frustrations are really important to understand and learn from and obviously to overcome. Next slide. Next. So again, as I mentioned, I'm a new uh, app, uh, struggling user of, of an EMR, uh, one uh, commercial EMR system. And what we're hearing over and over again is that uh, really don't worry. It's just a matter of time. Once you sort of get trained and familiar with the system and, and enter the backlog of medications and the patient's prior problems, there have been efforts to try to transport those over from our old system to our new system. It ha really hasn't worked uh, perfectly well. Uh, and then especially once you sort of learn all the tricks and the shortcuts, the macros, the, the smart phrases, uh, we'll be getting going with new workflows. And uh, really don't, uh, don't fret too much, even though it feels frustrating. And, uh, and uh, even once we sort of get moving, which we are after a few months, uh, there's a phase which I guess we've heard uh, was talked to us from the vendor or the, uh, our, the saying, we're going to enter the phase of the trough of disillusionment, where we um, you know, don't feel quite as frustrated, but we sort of reach this other moment. But uh, mainly we're told that just sort of we'll get through it and things will be okay. And uh, I, I worry a little bit about that. Next slide. This is a quote from a, a, a famous abolitionist. Uh, Frederick Douglass, and he was a slave, a runaway slave. And uh, in the South in the late 1850s, uh, some visitors, so he was, you know, advocating, preaching about the evils of slavery and how, how uh, much it needed to be, you know, eliminated. And he's, some visitors came back and they said to them, you know, really, it didn't seem so bad. The slaves seemed happy. They're smiling. They're tilling the field. They're well adjusted. And then Frederick Douglass is reported to have looked at this person and said that it's even worse than I thought. So I think uh, adapting to some of these suboptimal systems, um, I'm not saying this is as bad as slavery, but I think it does talk about um, whether we're really um, uh, asking the right questions and really uh, uh, we want to do more than just adjust to uh, the suboptimal. Next slide. One more thing, just to sort of put this in perspective, we're talking about safety. I do a lot of work with CRICO, that's the Harvard Malpractice Insurer, and uh, they've looked at uh, the growing role of EMRs in contributing to malpractice cases. Again, this is a whole separate lecture. But the thing that I think is interesting, if you look down here, documentation, you could sort of say is sort of a small problem um, relative to some of these others. We all know about malpractice. If it's not documented, it wasn't done, and we can't prove this in a court of law. Um, I guess what I would say, and I think what Crico also says, is if you look at some of these other bars, clinical judgment, communication, uh, behavior, just some of these others, that really clinical documentation is playing a very important role underlying these and also its potential to improve on these. So I would say, even though it looks small, it's very big. Next slide. So what are some of the ways that it's failing? Again, I think some of these are, are, are the apparent ones that we've mentioned, and others are less visible. I certainly do want to say that it's kind of a serious 
on the demoralization and the of primary care and other frontline clinicians. We talked about the added time for charting, and which is felt to be uh, subtracted from time for caring. It's degrading the pride in people's notes and the workmanship. And uh, I, I always wish people couldn't read my notes sometimes. And they were in my legible handwriting because they're so uh, not uh, the way I would want them if I would have enough time and tools to do them better. There's this clutter. There's a loss of trust in the quality and access and ease of finding information. And then there's the question of scribes, which many feel is really a, a very uh, workable and nice solution. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. Uh, but what I would say all this adds up to is that we need to move away from paper uh, conceptualization towards a more integrated process redesign. So this idea of not just turning paper into an electronic chart uh, is, is, is not the way to think about this. Next slide. Uh, many others are also writing about this. This is just uh, uh, one of the many, next slide please. This is one of the many places uh, that uh, I have sort of gotten my inspiration from. Some, a lot of people are writing about the need to reconceptualize the EHR in its entirety and where clinical documentation fits in. Next slide. Um, and this is a recent study that uh, actually collected data and views. Next, if the slide advances here, it's a little delay. It's another aspect of using computers. So Peter Embray and his group uh, looked at uh, uh, some of the uh, 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 findings and implications reviewing a multi-site study of clinicians and administrators. Next slide. And really they came to a similar conclusion that uh, we really need to conceptualize it. Our, our current findings suggest that the current uh, documentation system and usage is not optimally meeting users' needs. It appears to be based on an outdated paper paradigm is really what he's referring to. They're referring to while the clear benefits of clinical electronic documentation, the degree in angst and dissatisfaction seeks to a fundamental need for change that probably reflects the need for a new paradigm governing how such systems should be built, implemented, and used. And again, the specific findings you can dig up from that paper. Next slide. Here's the way I put it together in the next slide. And, and this is, uh, if you want to just sort of, sort of remember or print out one slide from this presentation, this is my attempt to try to put this together and think about what are these new redesigned functions that we are interested in uh, uh, building and promoting. Number one, the record has to reflect and record our thinking, okay? So it shouldn't be just checking off a lot of boxes to get billing or, or a certain uh, um, reimbursement score, but rather really the most important thing is to understand what the clinician is thinking about the patient and how well these uh, systems are doing to facilitate this, I think what we need to think critically. Um, the documentation should be interactive. So it's not just a matter of me dumping a bunch of stuff into the computer, but the, the documentation, the EMR, should be helpful in prompting me and helping me ask questions and reminding me of things. Uh, we emphasize it in several other bullets as well. Information should be able to be put in one way and displayed another. So if I'm very uh, rushed in terms of my clinical encounter and need to put in information one way, the uh, design of the system ought to be so that it is designed so that it could display it in a much more clear way and a much better organized way and or in a way that depending on certain users need one view of the information versus others are different. It should be produced jointly and shared with the patient. I think many people on the call are familiar with this open notes project. People at Beth Israel and Geisinger, other places around the country are uh, opening up all their notes to the patient. And not, the idea is not only should it be viewed by the patient, but the patient should be helping us together put this information in and producing uh, clear documentation and accurate documentation. Uh, it should be an aid to synthesizing and organizing the history of the course. So again, it shouldn't uh, further make things a mess or fragmentation, as another bullet says, but this should actually be helping me, especially as a primary care physician, as I try to tie things together for my patients. We should be able to understand changes over time how the information changes. So if somebody's weight is in there, uh, so if, if they're losing weight, it should be clear as we uh, uh, go through the record time by time. It should support clinical cognition. Again, this is something Mark uh, Graber and our society think about a lot, about how to make the visual information, the information in there visually uh, supportive of the cognition and not creating extra burden and certainly not relying on memory for us to remember things. This is probably the most important safety bullet here. 
It should prevent overlooking of problems and premature closure around a diagnosis. So we need to um, uh, make sure somebody has a splenectomy that doesn't get lost somehow. And Adam probably is going to talk about problemless vis-a-vis -vis that. Uh, help overcome rather than increase fragmentation. I think this bullet implies, and I would say currently the records further fragment information, and we need to redesign it to do the opposite. And then should be a design for a tool for reliable communication and follow-up. I just attended an M&M where somebody developed a paralysis. They were supposed to go for an MRI and a neurosurgery consult for an abnormal neck CT, and um, you know, lo and behold, that was in the chart, in the note, but nothing happened. No one saw that. No one followed up on the next slide. And so what are some of these sort of requirements to fulfill these, uh, maybe people would say pie in the sky wishes, but I, I don't think they're, they're uh, ones that we should uh, back away from. So one thing that we need is, is to have the problem is more integrated into the workflow of uh, writing these notes. Again, I don't have time to really detail this. The EPIC system has something called problem-based charting. I find it very frustrating right now and haven't been able to figure out how to conquer that, and I think there needs to be much more uh, thought put into how you make problem lists integrate into these clinical notes in a smart way, in an efficient way. There needs to be a reliable, continuously updated family history. Uh, this, this idea about uh, figuring out how you get a family history in there that you took and it's six years old, somebody developed colon cancer in the last three years in the person's family. How do we do that? Um, incorporation of patient symptoms and questionnaires into the history. There should be much easier ways that uh, we can do that in much more standardized ways. Again, I, all these are longer discussions, but I'm just throwing these out uh, for this brief presentation to you consider. An enriched, and I called it omnipresent social history. I need right in front of me social details of the patients. You know, their daughter is using drugs, their husband committed suicide, they're struggling with the loss of a child. All this has to be, you know, somewhere where I, you know, don't have to rely on my memory to remember that about the patient. Uh, dry, proactive follow-up and plan. As I mentioned, when we make a plan, it has to uh, be uh, made trackable and reliable. Visual affordance is for cognitive support so things don't get lost or buried. The abnormalities stick out in red. Um, Rapid access to information while writing a note. So if I don't know what the causes of hematuria or something in the middle or I need to be reminded, I should be able to push buttons and be helping get, get reminded of that. And I shouldn't, or even what the patient's prior urine, if it showed any blood in the urine. Uh, I shouldn't have to close the note and start over and multiple clicks. It should be, ra or lose the note even. Uh, uh, support my decision making. So we all know about clinical alerts. Often they're nuisance or overridden. Um, I should be able to uh, have help in decisions I'm trying to make, and we need to figure out how to do that. Real integration of voice recognition. Um, I am a very big fan of voice recognition. If people aren't using this on their, uh, their, their smartphone and they're typing in their text messages, when you hang up the call today, just start using Siri, and you'll be amazed how far this technology has come. And this is a really the way to get some narrative information in there without having to do a lot of typing. And again, the bottom line in terms of the time it should take, it should take half of what it currently does. That's sort of what I, my estimate would be. It should be done uh, by the end of the patient uh, or at least by the end of the clinic session so I don't have to bring these notes home. Next slide. Um, so here's sort of what my typical uh, encounter with a patient, some of the flow in places where the uh, the EMR is really not supporting me the way it should. The first is what I call the interval history. Um, so before the patient comes in, I, I, mean, I spend time pre-populating my note. It's, it's really important to know what's happened to the patient since you last seen them. The person comes in, oh, doctor, uh, you didn't uh, hear I had my, uh, my knee replaced or, or my heart transplanted or, or I was in the ICU or the emergency room. Uh, it's, it's really important for me to sort of know what's been happening and I shouldn't have to page through a lot of notes or be embarrassed that the patient caught me not really knowing what was happening with them, but it should be organized in a way that's uh, fed and readily available to me. Uh, Open-ended invitation, so I start the encounter by asking the patient how they're doing. I, I, that's the one time I'm a very good touch typist, but I have my hands off the keyboard and having eye contact. But uh, 
and then but much of the sort of subjective part of the uh, um, the uh, encounter is really uh, patients describing things and I'm um, I'm typing away but uh, again how to get that in there in the computer and not have it be a mess we'll talk we need to think about how to do that better then there's something that I call the review of problems people talk about review of systems but the most important thing is to run through each person's each problem and not rely on my memory oh you have headaches three times a week uh, are they more or less that medicine I started you the last time did it, did it uh, help you did it, uh, abort the headaches um, so we should be able to run through the problems and, and update them and figure out a way of doing that, really uh, including my prior assessment so I can remember what I was thinking about that. We should not lose track of problems, as I mentioned, overlooking problems or dropping balls is one of the uh, important safety issues. Social history at the forefront, as I mentioned, even something as simple as the kids' ages should be updated. So you have kids that are two, four, and six years old, and I, that's in my social history, but I just I saw the patient three years ago. So that should automatically be updated, and small things like that, I think, would help us keep track of the patient. And this idea about putting the assessment on the bottom, buried at the end of the note. Um, next slide is something that people are debating how to get away from this. Um, the copy and paste, to talk about two, you know, both problems and solutions. So this is a quote from Bill Tierney, one of my heroes, uh, head of medicine at Registry. I've outlawed copy and pasting. It is illegal and immoral and bad for both patient care and student resident education. If I find a student in my ward team copying, cutting and pasting anything in a note, they flunk the rotation. Next slide. So that's one view. And uh, you can see copy and pasting does contribute. These are some more of these uh, data from the CRICO claims and uh, pre-populating copying and pasting of, of the ones that do have EHR factors in this malpractice case, there's a, you know, 10% of those cases. Next, next slide, please. Um, here's a, sort of a different view. Uh, some people say copying and pasting is, is by definition, billing fraud. Um, uh, this is a recent quote in, uh, in Janum Internal Medicine. Uh, in our view, the federal government should not penalize physicians for, for the responsible use of tools in the electronic health records, sorry, the typo, record a record that facilitate efficiency and appropriate standardization of documentation of care. So this is a different view of copy and paste. I think a more positive one, in some ways one I would more, more like, more endorse. Next slide. So how do we put this together? Next slide. Let's keep pushing through. Is copy and paste the cause of these bloated, untrustworthy notes? Or is it a symptom of more fundamental design flaws? I, I would la argue the latter. So I guess I would just sort of say two cheers for copy and paste. Copying for the existing history is not unreasonable as a starting point for today's notes. Uh, if somebody's leg was amputated the last visit, it's likely it's still going to be amputated this visit, although David Bates, my colleague in Boston, Brigham, talks about a case of how DKA, diabetic diabetic ketoacidosis turned into BKA on a note and got perpetrated on note after note when the person's coming walking in on both normal legs. Um, but, uh, you know, somebody's daughter is on drugs or somebody has multiple warty lesions on their face, um, I'm, I'm comfortable copying that forward. Uh, if I'm doing this honestly and carefully, I think it, it's, uh, it's reasonable and it's also an efficient way to avoid manually typing big blocks of text. Next slide. So the question is how to next, what, yeah, how to minimize the negatives and maximize the positives. There just needs to be a lot more discussion about that. And it also needs to be recognized, I think, that copy and paste is in some ways a creative workaround, but it bypasses some of the real redesign needs to making uh, charting more efficient. The next slide talks about another approach to try to streamline things, which is scribes, which many of my colleagues in primary care feel it's the best thing has really happened to them being able to practice uh, and um, I, I would not uh, do anything to take those strides away and we're going to actually be hopefully doing a study looking at whether that improves diagnosis and I think perhaps it does. But I would also uh, raise the question about whether this is a workaround. So these are some of the functions of scribes from a recent uh, um, a white paper and the, the, the journal and uh, my computer. Uh, 
tr tracking down, uh, uh, assisting in navigating the EMR and entering data, and doing more complete notes. Um, uh, and it's basically, as I said, been shown to be cost effective and beneficial for jo restoring joy to practice. Next slide. But the question I would raise is that, um, I'm waiting for the slides, are, are the scribes a really wonderful or workaround? So should EMRs be so difficult to navigate and find things? Shouldn't there be easier ways to locate information? Uh, shouldn't it be easier to enter data, as I mentioned, uh, voice recognition, but other ways of having information populated? Uh, shouldn't EMRs be designed in a way that there's less distraction from a patient? Do you really have to take the clinician completely away from the computer to have this not be a distraction, or could it be redesigned in a better way? I would argue the latter. Um, we have more complete, timely notes. Again, uh, there has to be ways of facilitating this, and, and our scribes perhaps a work around and tracking down missing information and restoring joy to our work. Uh, again, I, I just think that this bespeaks to some of the failures of the EMI and with, with scribes being a workaround to uh, doing this more um, smarter. So using the burden or working around the poor designs of EMR, that's a question I'll leave with you. Next slide. Um, so realizing the potential of electronic documentation uh, really requires uh, going even further. And I'm just going to quickly go through these next slides. Uh, they're available in the New England Journal of Medicine. We've presented these five years ago. Next slide. Uh, so each of these is a role for clinical electronic documentation. If it were redesigned, I've touched on many of these. I'm going to check on a couple. Uh, next, um, and there's 15 of these functions that uh, I think if you refer to these slides and the, 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 this, I think you can imagine how we could be doing much better. Next slide. Um, uh, ensuring coordination. We talked about this. Uh, engineering follow-up and feedback. Um, helping as a placeholder when we get interrupted. Next slide. Uh, helping us figure out probabilities for better diagnosis, uh, getting us instant second opinions as we're writing our notes, and uh, increasing efficiency. Again, that's the holy grail that we have hardly realized, so we would have more time to spend with the patient. Next slide. And so this idea about clinical documentation just being the paperwork we have to do when we finish the job, I'd like to redefine it from, next slide, next, next, from CYA, which, you know, the insurers and the billers were urging us to do, next slide, to a canvas for your assessment. That's what CYA should be standing for. Next slide. And what do we mean by a canvas for your assessment? Uh, being able to put your differential diagnosis, weigh the likelihood of different diagnosis, the, your degree of uncertainty. Next slide. Again, I'm seeing the time here. Uh, what do we mean by a good assessment? I've talked about the five Ds. There's really very little written about what, is, what should be in an assessment, but helping to define the problem. What is the differential diagnosis and the cause of exacerbation? How's the patient doing now? What's the time course, the response to therapy? What needs to be done now? What do we need to know? And also, what don't we know? What are our uncertainties? These, these are important things we should be getting in there. I think voice recognition can help us a lot uh, quickly getting our thoughts. Next slide. Um, so in summary, what are the practical next steps? Um, we need to have better integration of problems and problem lists into the workflow, uh, realizing the role for voice recognition, real-time support. This has become one of my crusades with our new system. I ought to be able to pick up the phone and somebody ought to be able to help me, knowledgeable about the system, to get on stock or to figure out how to do something I'm not able to do. Uh, there had to be error reporting and problem reporting, more transparency for the vendors, much more so than we currently have, uh, better learning from watching how clinicians use these systems. I think we almost need something called a S, -S ratio, a sailing versus suck ratio, or, or how often the help desk is help desk that doesn't exist where now it's where people can help us, they, they can't answer my questions. So in, we basically need to reconceptualize, redesign, reevaluate, and have metrics to see how we're doing on these redesigned functions. Uh, I think we're at the end of this next slide. Yeah, so that's the end of the formal presentation. I've given you a couple other slides you can look at from studies we've done, maybe the Q&A. I know I've got a couple minutes over, but uh, 
do we have any questions or um, how should we proceed? Hi, Gordy. This is Mark. Thanks very much. We're a little behind, but I would like to ask you one thing. You know, you've outlined such a nice vision for how clinical documentation needs to be and how it needs to work more effectively. Are there any collaboratives or groups in place now that are, are really working in that direction? Um, you know, I think others on the call might know better. I think there's uh, pockets of efforts to be done. I mean, there's, there was a working group and a large conference a conference brought together under the American um, Amy American Medical Informatics Association. Uh, there's certainly work groups. There's um, user groups within the, the vendor. You know, people have a certain vendor product. Uh, there's some. Uh, work I know at Kaiser, people are trying to uh, re-engineer their documentation in some of these ways. I, I would say that there's not sort of a moonshot uh, project. I, I, the VA is probably another place worth mentioning where some the efforts to turn frustrations into some better workflow. But and of course, Scribes I think is there's a lot of experimentation going on. But I, I would say most of it's sort of low-level, fragmented, and certainly not that sort of holistic vision that I. I, I lust for, and I think many on the call would desire. Okay, Gordy, thank you so much. We appreciate it. I'd like to move to our next speaker, Dr. Adam Wright. Adam is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a researcher in biomedical informatics. He studies clinical decision support, data mining, and electronic health records. His specific areas of research include problem lists, using EHRs to reduce medical errors and malpractice, and learning from large clinical databases. Uh, his presentation is titled, Making More Accurate Problem Lists, Challenges and Recommendations. What, what I've always liked about Adam's work is it's, it's so creative and forward-looking and solution-oriented, and I think you'll see that in his presentation. Adam, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate the, the kind introduction. As, uh, as Mark handed out, I'm actually going to frame my talk around a uh, problem that, that we had at, at the hospital where I work and uh, a way that we tried to, to solve it. Um, just to put uh, the, the talk I'll give in, in context, when I think about clinical documentation, you know, there are so many facets. There's unstructured um, documentation like our notes, and then there's the structured documentation that we do on problem lists, documentation of patient allergies, recording and use sometimes in structured ways of family history and social history. And so I think uh, I enjoyed Gordy's talk a lot and, uh, and uh, heard a lot about the note and, and other aspects. And my talk is going to focus specifically on, uh, on structured documentation and the problem list in particular. So we'll move forward one slide here. Or maybe one more slide after that, too. All right, so this is a nostalgic slide for, for me. This is a photo of the longitudinal medical record. This is the EMR that we've used since uh, the late 90s at the Brigham uh, and uh, is, uh, is still in use uh, throughout uh, much of the partner's healthcare system. And uh, we about uh, now, I guess, five or six weeks ago, switched from the LMR to EPIC. And so in some ways, this may be one of the last times that, that we'll actually get to show this uh, this slide, but uh, our, our EMR is, I think is, is pretty typical. Uh, this is our outpatient system, and uh, you can see that it has, uh, you know, typical features like, you know, place document notes, place for for allergies and medications, a place for for lab results, and of course, a problem list. And uh, in our EMR, uh, the different parts of the, of the the display are configurable. So I have the problem list right front and center because because I think it's so important and so interesting. But uh, one, I think, uh, important thing to say about, about our problem list and the problem list in general is that, you know, our, our first and main use of the problem list, obviously, is to take care of the patient. You know, you're seeing a patient, especially a patient that you don't know, uh, and you want to sort of have a quick snapshot of their health and any uh, conditions that they might be uh, dealing with. The problem list is at least designed to be uh, the kind of central place that you would look to, to do that. Um, the problem list also drives a lot of other care processes. So you can see at the top here we have what we call reminders. So these are some of our rule-based uh, clinical decision support. And so many of them are uh, based on uh, what problems a patient has. So uh, you can see this patient is getting some suggestions about his diabetes, uh, and that's driven by the fact that he has diabetes on his problem list. He's getting a coronary artery disease suggestion. Uh, and uh, that one is actually sort of to start an anaplatelet therapy like aspirin, but it's uh, even sort of further modified by the patient's history of peptic ulcer disease as a potential contraindication. So somehow having a good and complete problem list uh, is central to uh, 
doing good clinical decision support. We also use it for research. We use it in our quality measurement programs and our reporting programs, some of our care management programs where we, we pull up panels of diabetic patients and have them see or be followed by uh, population managers or nurse care managers are all driven by, by the problem list. So if you afford one slide. Um, so this, I think, sort of summarizes what I said. Uh, so if you go forward one more slide there. Um, and uh, here is sort of the stark reality. Uh, having a good problem is, is pretty hard. Um, there's a lot of uh, discussion and even uncertainty uh, in most organizations that we've studied about the problem, specifically who owns the problem list. Uh, when we talk to primary care providers, they often say, you know, this is a team sport. We should all be maintaining the problem list. We're all responsible for this piece of documentation. Um, when we talk to uh, specialists, uh, we actually often hear something different, which is, oh, that belongs to the PCPs. I don't edit the problem list. And so there's a tension where the, I think the PCPs are hoping that the specialists would update the problem list, and the specialists, uh, in some cases at least, are saying, you know, that's not really sort of, you know, in the scope of, of, of what I do. And uh, uh, resolving that tension is, is tricky. Um, there are some kind of existential questions about what is a problem, right? I think we could all agree that diabetes is a problem, right? This is a longitudinal thing that we should be following that is a clear, diagnosable, articulable entity with known sort of treatment and, and management plans. Um, there's trickier entities like chest pain, which is obviously seems like something that's important to keep track of, but uh, may not be sort of, you know, refined into a clinical disease uh, kind of uh, formulation. And then also things like a urinary tract infection, which uh, is, uh, you know, is a specific diagnosis. But in most cases, a UTI is pretty self-limiting. We might not need to track it over time, although maybe it would be interesting uh, if a patient has history of recurrent uh, urinary tract infections. And so uh, figuring out what a problem is, I think, is kind of an interesting existential uh, challenge. Um, there's some other questions about, you know, how should we involve the patient? Uh, for a long time in my organization, we didn't let patients see their own problem list. They were only visible to providers. And there was actually a lot of debate about whether we should expose them through the, the personal health record because, you know, there are occasionally things on the, the problem list like, uh, you know, that are, you know, maybe potentially stigmatizing or things like, you know, drug-seeking behavior or obesity where the patient may not like the way that we were describing them or we might not have discussed our, our thoughts about that. But we eventually made the decision uh, to share the problems with patients and had many fewer issues than I think we were working worried we might have uh, when we made that decision. Uh, but the key issue that, that uh, we've been dealing with in my research I'm going to talk about today is the fact that unfortunately our problem lists are often inaccurate or incomplete. Go forward a slide for me. So this is uh, the results of a chart review that, that my research group did. And so uh, we manually reviewed a large number of uh, charts and tried to figure out what uh, problems patients really actually had and then looked to see whether the corresponding problems were on their problem list. And since I've been using diabetes as an example, I'll, I'll use it right now. So we reviewed uh, you know, several hundred charts, figured out which subset of patients really had diabetes by looking at their medications and their notes and, uh, and their problem list, but, but among other, other things. So what we found was that only about 63% of patients with diabetes had diabetes on their problem list, uh, which was uh, really disappointing for us because that meant that about uh, you know, over a third of our diabetic patients we're not getting the decision support that we had created for diabetic patients. They didn't show up in our quality reports when we ran our quality reports. If we tried to assemble a cohort for a research study, uh, unfortunately those patients wouldn't appear in that, that cohort. And so we were really concerned about the, the completeness of the problem list. Um, if you go forward to another slide. There you go. Excellent. Uh, we also had a couple of uh, external causes of concern uh, about the problem list. One of them was uh, pay for performance dollars at stake uh, in our contracts with a couple of uh, large payers in Massachusetts, Blue Cross and Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. And they uh, had established targets that said that basically 75% of our patients uh, with uh, three sort of sets of conditions that, that they were interested in had to have them sort of correctly on their problem list. Otherwise, we had to give back uh, $735,000, which is a lot of money for, for us. And at the same time, the stage one meaningful use requirements came out, which required an 80% uh, threshold for, for problem list usage. And this was kind of a funny uh, metric. It's basically 80% of the patients in your uh, population had to have at least something on their problem list uh, that... Uh, or uh, coded indications they had no problem. So there's no, no actual requirement that the problem list be complete or up to date or even that the problem on their list was accurate, but there had to be something on that. And so if you go forward another slide, please. 
you can see that uh, uh, there were no problems where we were up to 80 percent, and uh, in fact, for uh, most of the key problems, we were below the 75 percent threshold that, that we had set for our pay for performance programs. So we were worried about this, obviously, um, and we decided we wanted to try to tackle tackle the problem. Um, so if you go forward another slide, actually, you know one more too, also. Uh, we turned to a uh, machine learning technique called association rule mining. So this is the same technique that Netflix uses or Amazon used to, to make recommendations. So if you've ever purchased a book and it said, you know, people who enjoyed this book also enjoyed this other book, um, uh, we thought that we might be able to use a similar uh, set of techniques to basically say, you know, people who, you know, enjoyed prescribing insulin also enjoyed adding diabetes to the problem list. Uh, so basically to find uh, from data, from, you know, our large population of, of patient medical records, uh, patterns that we could use to sort of uh, predict when a patient had a particular disease. And so I created some sort of uh, simple uh, records here that, that I thought might motivate the idea here. So if you go forward one slide and light, light a few of these up, you can see that uh, in these four patients, I listed the, their medications and their problems, and uh, there's this pattern where all the patients on lisinopril also have hypertension. You go to the next one. See a similar pattern here for insulin and diabetes. Go to the next one. Uh, you see a pattern emerging for, for metformin and diabetes, but uh, if you go forward one more, you'll see that there was a uh, sort of an exception to this, right? This was a patient who was on metformin, but uh, had polycystic ovarian syndrome rather than, than diabetes. But, as you sort of repeat this process on, you know, a very large number of patients' records, you start to develop uh, some statistical uh, sense of the strength of association between uh, things like medications and problems, uh, we also do this for laboratory results and problems, uh, billing codes and problems, uh, and uh, a few others that we'll get to in a minute. So if you go forward one more slide. Um, we did this for 100,000 patients, so it's a sort of massive amount of data. Actually, we originally wanted to do it for all the patients at the Brigham, but our IRB was nervous, and so uh, they somehow 100,000 seemed safer than, than all the patients. And so we uh, developed some software to do this data mining, and we characterized the, the results by some different statistical uh, measurements, and then we compared them to gold standards, so Lexicomp's uh, drug knowledge uh, compendium, and then Mosby's lab manual uh, for, for lab results. If you go forward to another slide. Um, and so uh, we uh, had pretty good results uh, for, from this. What we found was that we could, uh, you know, single item associations, uh, we could find sort of, you know, relatively strong associations, especially when we sort of tried to start doing multiple item associations. So for example, uh, hemoglobin A1C plus uh, insulin together were, were a particularly strong predictor of, of diabetes, as, as you might imagine. So we decided that we wanted to uh, kind of extend this association rule mining work, uh, which was done more to motivate the, the methodology or the technique, and actually build a knowledge base that we could then use uh, to improve problem lists. And so we started by picking some problems that, that we were interested in, and I'll, let me show you the ones we picked if you go forward a slide. There we go. So we picked these 17 problems, and uh, our motivation of the, for, for picking the, these problems to sort of target for problem list improvement was kind of multifaceted. Uh, one of the uh, goals was to identify uh, the problems where we had pay for performance uh, or clinical decision support that the problems were driving. We also picked a few problems that we were just interested in, you know, clinically for one reason or another, or we thought we had particularly sort of interesting or good uh, predictive rules for, from the, the prior study where we did this data mining. If you go forward another slide. So what we did is sort of, you know, kind of ROC curves kind of turned on their side. If we looked at different permutations of uh, rules for predicting, in this case, for example, whether somebody had uh, diabetes. And so we looked at various thresholds for the hemoglobin A1C. Should we look at people with, you know, greater than 9, greater than 7? Uh, should we look at, uh, you know, any, uh, you know, oral hypoglycemic drug? Uh, should we exclude metformin because of the polycystic ovarian syndrome thing? How should we treat insulin? And if you sort of go to the right here, you find rules that are more sensitive. So they're finding more and more patients. But, uh, you know, there's this kind of classic trade-off as you formulate these, these kind of decision rules or diagnostic tests for that matter where, you know, your positive predictive value falls off as your sensitivity increases. So we decided to, to pick a version of the rule uh, that's, uh, you know, the second from, from the right and, and use that to sort of classify who we thought was likely to have diabetes. You go forth another slide. So uh, this is the final rule that, that we used. And, and I, I should point you guys uh, to this. We uh, wrote a paper in the Journal of the American Medical Informatics Association, or JAMIA, which we'd be happy to share with you guys, which includes the entire sort of set of rules and their performance characteristics, if anybody's interested in uh, looking at the, the actual details of this. So go forward another slide. 
And so we did a validation of this on the training set where we developed the rules and on a separate uh, validation set to make sure that they worked right. Our goal uh, always was to maximize the positive predictive value uh, even at the, the cost of uh, missing you know, some sensitivity just because we didn't want to give people false positive alerts if their patient had a particular condition. And so speaking of the alerts, if we go forward a slide here, and then you can go forward, forward one more after this. So what we did was we built a uh, decision support uh, aid into the longitudinal medical record, and it sort of ran all of these rules, uh, which were designed to predict, you know, ideally with 95% certainty, but, but as high a certainty as we could achieve, whether a patient had each of those 17 problems. And if they did, and that problem was missing for, from their problem list, we made a suggestion. So you can see uh, this patient, this is a, a real patient, we, we've blacked out all of their information. Um, uh, but uh, they had coronary artery disease, uh, and uh, we were pretty sure of that because they were on Plavix, Lupitigrel, and they didn't build for coronary artery disease, but that was not on their problem list. Similar for congestive heart failure, they were on a couple of heart failure meds, uh, they'd been billed uh, several times for heart failure, again, not on their problem list. Uh, for diabetes, they had an elevated hemoglobin A1C, uh, but diabetes wasn't on their problem list. For hypertension, they had been billed uh, for uh, hypertension in the past, and they were on an antihypertensive agent, but again, not on their problem list. And lastly, they were on Synthroid, which almost certainly means that they have hypothyroidism, uh, or at least some, some variation of the thyroid dysfunction, and uh, uh, they did not have hypothyroidism on their list. So we gave physicians uh, sort of three options when they were faced with this. They could sort of, uh, you know, if they left the thing checked, they would um, sort of state, I think my patient does have this problem, and then they would get rid of the uh, Get rid. They would sort of get rid of the alert forever, and they would add the problem to to the problem list. If they said that the patient didn't have the problem, then uh, they would. We would remember that the patient didn't have the problem. We wouldn't make this prompt again. Uh, and then they could also just sort of close the window or cancel or kind of get out of the the alert. And uh, in that case, we would uh, wait and prompt them again the next time that they they saved a note for for that patient. But uh, we give them a break for for a while because they didn't want to deal with it at that point. So you go forward a slide, let me show you what the results look like. Or actually, let me tell you about the trial. So we ran this as a randomized trial for for six months at the Brigham. So we uh, took our uh, primary care clinics and we allocated half of the them uh, to get the alert. Half of the clinics didn't get the alert. If you go forward one slide, then I'll show you the results. So we watched uh, the clinics for six months before we turned the alert on in kind of a surveillance mode. And you can see the first half of these uh, two, two lines, the control group actually had a slightly higher rate of adding problems than, than the intervention group, but uh, they, were, they were pretty close to each other. And then when we turned the alert on, which happened in the middle of the graph, you kind of see this left turn in the intervention line where the rate at which the study problems, the 17 problems that we listed, uh, were being added uh, increased uh, rather dramatically. And so we were pretty excited uh, uh, to, to see that result. And we go forward to, uh, to the next uh, slide with a table on it. There was, uh, depending on how you control for uh, the baseline differences in um, in uh, the clinic's rates of adding problems, about a three threefold-ish difference in uh, the rate at which problems were, were being added. Although there were, you know, some problems that had uh, much greater, uh, you know, jump like congestive heart failure, and then others where we didn't see quite as significant uh, uh, of a of a result. Often because they were just very uncommon problems like myasthenia gravis or, or sickle cell disease. Uh, chronic kidney disease was another one that that I thought uh, had a, a particularly high jump. And one of the things that was exciting. But that one is for most of the problems that we looked at, like diabetes, we knew the patient had diabetes, right? Somehow if you looked at their record, you know, we were treating their diabetes, they were going to the diabetes clinic, no one just, for some reason, no one had bothered to put it on their, their problem list until we prompted them. With chronic kidney disease, it turns out that there's this whole range of patients who are sort of floating along in the healthcare system with uh, elevated creatinine or reduced uh, GFR, and uh, nobody's kind of appreciated that they actually meet uh, criteria for, for chronic kidney disease. And there's some pretty good evidence that sort of early recognition and treatment of, uh, of you know, early stage chronic kidney disease can pr uh, delay uh, the progression of, of kid kidney disease. So we'd like to sort of catch those patients and pull them into our orbit and, and potentially provide some uh, preventative treatment to them. So we were excited to see uh, a pretty good effect on that. You go forward one more slide to the acceptance rates here. The acceptance rates were, were pretty high, on average about 40%. Uh, and I told you there were sort of 
two ways you could override the alert. One of them was to actually say, my patient doesn't have that. Uh, that was actually pretty uncommonly done. Uh, the, the other is just to sort of close out of the alert, and uh, that, that was much more common. Um, and in fact, there were there's sort of this uh, provider heterogeneity where uh, a lot of the providers uh, you know, uh, really kind of bonded with the alert and sort of did it, but there were a number of providers who actually never accepted one of these alerts, and they tended to be people who at baseline sort of weren't very interested in the problem list. So I think it was uh, enough to help some people, but there's some people that just kind of didn't have the same problem list uh, enthusiasm that I guess I have uh, and uh, probably need to find uh, additional ways to, to reach out to that group. So if you go forward a couple of slides here, uh, let me close with uh, where we're going next. So we did a small study of this at the Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, and had uh, pretty positive results. And we uh, recently received a, a new grant from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute uh, to expand uh, this this work. We're expanding it in several ways. Uh, you know, our original rules were based entirely on structured data like medications, labs, diagnoses, also uh, procedure history, uh, vital signs in a few cases, um, and occasionally a few other uh, sort of minor uh, the elements in the, in the record. We want to add uh, natural language processing to sort of take clinical text, uh, including things like progress notes, and uh, uh, fuse that with our structured uh, inference to improve the quality and uh, specificity of our of our inferences. So we're hoping that that will have a significant uh, significant improvement. Um, and then we're going to build, uh, you know, an updated alert, uh, which includes additional diseases and, and this uh, NLP results uh, uh, at the breakup. But we're also doing a uh, multi-site trial. So we're also involving uh, Holy Spirit Hospital, uh, Holy Spirit Health System, which is uh, based in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. Uh, recently uh, uh, joined the, the Geisinger system. Um, and uh, they're currently running uh, all scripts uh, medical record system, Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon, which is running Epic, and then Vanderbilt University, which is uh, running a self-developed system that and uh, uh, some parts of, of the, the McKesson Horizon system. Uh, so a uh, range of hospital types, geographies, and uh, information systems. We want to do a randomized trial across all four of those sites. Uh, with the goal of, I think, hopefully, again, showing, uh, if, we're, if we're lucky, that uh, this intervention has a positive effect on the rate at which people have problems, but also extended to, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, this we won't know until we do it, show that that, uh, that uh, process of adding more problems could lead to uh, improved quality measures. You know, we have this hypothesis that uh, once you add the problem, you'll be more aware of it clinically, uh, but also the decision support that, that we believe to be effective will fire more, uh, the quality measurement which we believe to be effective will sort of happen more, and uh, the hope is that uh, getting this kind of uh, assistance in maintaining the problem list would lead to better uh, at least process, out process measures, maybe outcome measures, but that's uh, certainly the the major hypothesis for, for this study, and it'll be a, a couple of years before we've wrapped up uh, all those details. But uh, hopefully, uh, if we uh, do this again in a few years, we'll have uh, more more detailed actual world results to share with you guys about that. So those are all of the slides that, that I had. So let me turn it back over to Mark to see where we're at. Adam, thank you. That was really interesting. Several people have asked where they can learn more about your study. So if you can send us information about abstracts or publications on this, we can build it into the slide set and people can pull it uh, back offline once it's posted. Oh yeah, I'll um, be delighted. We have se several papers and I'll share all of them with you guys and we'd be delighted to have you share them with, with other folks. That'd be great. So a couple of questions have come in. Um, one that's particularly interesting is, you know, this seems to work in a forward direction. Could you also use it in the reverse direction to detect problems that have been resolved or are inaccurate that are on the yeah. list now? What a great question. You know, so, so this is uh, certainly a challenge that we're dealing with, which is sort of old, out of date, uh, or even incorrect problems. Uh, I'll tell you, it's actually even a social problem here, here where I work, right? So, so I've asked people, if you see a frankly sort of incorrect problem on the problem list that you didn't add, would, would you inactivate it? The majority of people that I've asked have said, well, no, I wouldn't want to, you know, it's not my place, and I'm worried, like, you know, what if I'm responsible for it? And so uh, I think we don't really even have a sense that it's okay to inactivate uh, old problems, uh, unless you're the one, the one who asked 
out at them, which I think is, is probably off base, but, but it's, it's a strong sort of belief here. We are very interested in looking at, uh, you know, ways that we could inactivate old problems. We just haven't gotten very, very far with that. Um, we have done a little bit with medications. Now, when you prescribe antibiotics, you can set an expiration date and they follow the, the medication list. But I think that that's kind of a, a next frontier that we're hoping to look at. And if folks are interested in collaborating or thinking about that, or if they know of a solution that they've employed, we'd love to hear about that because, you know, I think the cluttered problem list is as bad as the empty problem list. Yeah, Adam, kind of a related question, and, and this gets a little bit philosophical, but sometimes, you know, you're, you're rock solid sure about a diagnosis, as you mentioned, like a patient with, you know, overt diabetes, and sometimes you're not real sure. You know, you think the patient may have it. There's some degree of uncertainty. Um, is there a way in your system to convey that? Yeah, absolutely. Although I have to say it's, it's not used as often as I, as I wish it was. So, so we have uh, the capability to both uh, add modifiers, so things like rule out or possibility or, you know, does not have, uh, and also to add comments. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people are, are have actually very few people were using the modifiers. Uh, some people were using the, the comments to, to convey that, but but I think that's something we should get better at doing. And that's one place I think where the, the clinical the narrative text often is more effective than, than the structured data. One sort of new phenomenon that I've been a little bit troubled by is uh, in some newer systems, there's been a lot of pressure to use, you know, billable ICD-9 codes or something like that uh, instead of, uh, you know, just sort of your typical code. And so, so I've seen systems where people want to put, you know, fever on the list and they're forced to, you know, put something very specific like, you know, malignant hyperthermia due to anesthesia or something. And so I think we need to be very careful about pushing people to put, you know, too much detail or more detail than they have. I think ideally you'd put the most specific thing that you're sure the patient has potentially with some comments about your certainty about that. The user experience for that I think is tricky and I think uh, it's an area that deserves more research. Adam, one, one quick technical question, maybe probably be our last one. Is the system you're developing, will it be interoperable with HL7? That's a great question. So, so, so we have uh, released uh, the, the old rules uh, just as, um, you know, a, a sort of technical description of the rules. We've uh, been very careful to use uh, standard code sets, the, the ones that, that were required in the sort of HITSB CCD, uh, you know, C32 spec. So, you know, SNOMAD for problems and RxNorm norm for, for medications. Uh, you know, H07 has uh, worked on some standards for sharing rules. Uh, that work is still in progress, but, but we would love to, to find good interoperable ways to, to share rules. And that's actually been a focus of some of our other research. But at this point, we could offer you good coded terms, but, but, but not, not very well structured rules. Great. Adam, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Great talk. Thanks, guys. It's our pleasure to have as our final speaker today, Dr. Anna Orlova. She's the Senior Director for Standards at AHIMA. Uh, she's a Visiting Associate Professor at Hopkins and a Clinical Associate Professor at the School of Public Health and Health Sciences at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Her expertise includes the adoption of health IT standards for knowledge, representation, and systems interoperability in healthcare. And is a member of the International Board of the Integrating of Healthcare Enterprise, a collaborative supporting interoperability standards. She teaches online courses on health IT standards and systems interoperability at Hopkins and on public health informatics at UMass. The title of her presentation is Putting Standards to Work, Improving Clinical Documentation. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much for introduction. And uh, if you can move, please, to the next slide. This is the outline of my presentation. We'll talk uh, briefly about challenges we're facing with adoption of health information and communication technology. This uh, term, interoperability, that everybody is right now talking about, and how, in fact, we could enable through interoperability, through implementing standards and um, having available the workforce that can both develop standards as well as operate standards-based health information and communication applications. And um, Dr. Schiff and Dr. Wright's presentations were actually very good um, uh, set up a great stage for me to talk about challenges. And I hope that in this presentation, you will see how from the pockets of activities and experimentations, 
we may uh, have already today a vision for a holistic approach on how to enable interoperability. In fact, not so-called interoperability, but information sharing in healthcare. If we can go to the next slide, I would like to cite that particular quote from the new book by Pamela Hess, Clinical Documentation Improvement Principles and Practices. It was published a few weeks ago by Akima, and it says that the next challenge for healthcare industry is ensuring consistency in content and meaning of clinical information as it evolves from manual to an electronic practice. You've heard today, uh, as you will see on the next slide, uh, the various um, examples on the uh, purpose that clinical documentation is created. It is supports quality care delivery, accurate reimbursement, regulatory compliance, but more importantly, health knowledge generation. And this presentation that I will uh, share with you today is in fact uh, is a presentation that I would like to see as a start of uh, us, both health information management professionals, those who operate uh, electronic health information systems, and those who generate medical knowledge, physicians, clinicians, could just work together to make this transition from paper-based to the um, uh, electronic uh, health information environment. The next slide will show you the book that uh, I uh, will be quoting from in this particular presentation. And it was actually eye-opening for me uh, as a person who joined Ahimar only one year ago, how close the methodology for clinical documentation improvement is aligned with what we've been calling in the past 15 years health sciences informatics. In this particular book, uh, you will find the activities that health information management professionals are um, um, deploying right now in their practices. And one of the slides that uh, graphs from this book is the one that I copied into this presentation on the next slide. It talks about collaborative intelligence, where physicians, nurses, HIM professionals, are contributing to the support of health content that we are all creating. And this content is derived from the snippets uh, of um, structured and national language processing type of data that we are, in fact, accumulating right now inside of the health information systems that we begin deploying. On the next slide, you will see that, in fact, this approach for collaborative intelligence is a true multidisciplinary team activity. And I just will show you with you right now some successes, successes that uh, we do not hear uh, a lot right now as uh, those who are uh, begin implementing integrated electronic health records, starting with the meaningful use um, initiatives. Uh, they are right now challenged with the uh, multitude of problems, challenges that uh, Dr. Schiff uh, very well described today. But I would like to talk about successes. And the next slide is the success slide. And success is coming from Children's Health System in Dallas, Texas. And this is from the presentation by Chief uh, Information Exchange Officer, Ms. Catherine Love. The hospital that the system that actually includes three hospitals that successfully implemented integrated electronic health records, as well as other technology tools such as computer system coding, automated physician query, templates for data capture that allows today um, improve the quality of documentation. Those templates, together with clinical pathways documents are developed together with clinicians and health information management professionals. And on the top of it, of course, automated data analytics tools allow today to conduct content validation, really uh, make it more easy on physicians to handle the query, 
and meet the um, benchmarks uh, of the uh, hospital operation. If you talk to Catherine Love today, which is her hospital as actually level seven interoperability for him, it is very uh, interesting how she responds to the most complicated questions that Dr. Shiv today uh, highlighted. Do you have problems with copy and paste? No? Do you have problems with overload of physicians uh, transitioning into EHR? No? Do you have problem with um, quarters using um, automated uh, coding systems? No? Do you have problems with training clinicians in using clinical documentation improvements and um, operating electronic health record systems? No? I, when I just heard her first um, uh, in September 2014 at the AHIMA National Convention, I thought that this is just a unique case. And then I went even for practical to that hospital, and for one week I observed why answers to those issues that are being raised in the presentation by Dr. Schiff. Uh, and as well as Dr. Wright with a problem list, for example, in that particular hospital are not a problem. And to me, the answer to this question is actually very dramatic. It is the nine years of deployment of electronic health records, and basically by experimentation and by the wisdom of this clinician and HIM professionals and the leadership of the hospital, they were able on their own to enable this collaborative intelligence by deploying these different tools. And right now, they see a huge return on investment. And lastly, is the prospective payment is a problem? No, nope, it's not a problem in this hospital. Why? What did they do? If I will show you on the uh, next slide, the list of activities that I am specifically um, fascinated and uh, happy that uh, in this um, hospital, uh, the HIM professionals and clinicians are working on standardization of clinical pathways documents, which is the standard operational procedures derived from the clinical guidelines and the best practices and peer-reviewed publications on how to uh, manage care for a specific condition but also uh, their work on the definition template on how to document the encounter for various conditions. And this is the list of those conditions, uh, selected list, because in fact, there are 29 clinical uh, templates that they were able just to develop. On the next slide, I just would like to reinforce that message that in fact, this um, uh, approach uh, described in the book by Pamela Hess is already successfully um, implemented in children. When those specific um, clinical uh, documents being already uh, standardized and tagged, supplying the children health content server. Those who are in a lesser time in implementation of integrated EHR, such as Johns Hopkins, next slide. They today are moving exactly into the same path, but they are reinventing this journey that children's health already uh, went through on their own. And Johns Hopkins is three years, about over three years in the implementation of integrated EHR. And the next slide, Mayo Clinic is about six months into implementation of EHR. And these pockets of activities are uh, customized um, activities uh, related to customi customization of electronic health record systems that we see in these hospitals. They, in fact, are breaking the um, ability of uh, sharing information between these health systems and others involved in information sharing. If you look at the next slide, we see interesting um, tendency here when this collaborative intelligence are supported right now by two types of content managers. 
One is health information management professionals, so we can call them electronic health record systems operators, and physicians for whom content management, as we saw from Dr. Wright's presentation, is the evidence-based medicine, it's a translational research based on the uh, information and knowledge stored in the clinical documentation derived from the patient record. In order to enable today the true collaborative intelligence in healthcare on the next slide, the challenge we're facing, the need we're facing is very simple. Clinicians, patients, and researchers need to share data. And as you can see on the next slide, this collaborative intelligence of children, Hopkins and Mayer, has to be put in place from experimentation, from the pocket and the activities, into the organized, holistic vision for enabling information sharing. To share information with the means of information and communication technology on the next slide is the term that we've been using right now called interoperability. Next slide will show you the definition of interoperability. And it is a different definition from the ones used in the um, uh, ONC interoperability roadmap. Can we go please to the next slide? I would like specifically to read you this definition because it's actually very um, comprehensive, as I think. It covers this notion of meaning and use uh, and uh, of information by those who need to know. Interoperability means the ability to capture, communicate, exchange data accurately, effectively, securely, consistently with different information technology systems, software, applications, and network in various settings, and exchange data such that clinical or operational purpose and meaning of data are preserved and unaltered. Look at the date, 2007. On the next slide, you will see that today, interoperability has proven to be very difficult to establish. Why? I think the answer to this question uh, was actually given by Dr. Schiff. I believe that because of this success, experimentation, and pockets of activity, we are focusing on different aspects of interoperability rather than on holistic approach. The next slide. We'll show you the three informatics uh, interoperability uh, pillars. Shared content, semantic interoperability, shared information exchange infrastructure, technical interoperability, shared rules of information exchange, functional interoperability, or rules of the road. Because I cannot see my audience and I cannot ask you a real-time question, um, and the question is, what are the industries that successfully enable interoperability today, I will share with you my example on the next slide. We may all dream about different cars, but our all cars on the road look pretty much alike based on the physics of the engine efficiency and the fuel efficiency and uh, the uh, uh, cost of whatever extra features we need to have on those cars. Technical infrastructure for those cars are built, it's very robust, and the rules of the roads are also established. How this um, industry were able to succeed? On the next slide, the answer to that question is, in fact, standards and people who build it. And if you will look at the uh, automobile industry, industry journey, they, in fact, started building the um, uh, whole operation from building the car. The cars that the only purpose was just to bring uh, me from point A to point B. When they built the car, they started building the road because it was better for them to travel along certain roads rather than on the dirt um, uh, in this direction rather than the road. And then to improve the safety, they put the signs on the road, rules of the road. In healthcare, we started this in reverse. In 1996, we built the rules of the roads called HIPAA. We didn't have the roads yet at that time. 
Right now, since 1996, in, in this 10-year period, we build the road. Actually, I'm sorry, 20-year period, we build the road. What we don't have, we don't have the cars. In fact, children, mayor, and um, uh, uh, Hopkins are building right now the wrong cars, experimenting of how the content can be represented. And sometimes this car looks like car, sometimes it looks like an airplane, sometimes it looks like a boat, and they all driving in whatever road we built for them, trying to follow the same rules. The holistic approach, I think that's what we actually really missing. And the challenges today is the standards that we need to implement this holistic approach. And the people who will be doing this are not really mature at the level of maturity as automobile industry has. But remember, automobile industry is 120 years old. We are 15 years old in conquering interoperability concepts. I just would like to focus on two things, which is, has related our uh, application to both health information management professionals and clinicians, semantic content and rules of the road. On the next slide, I just would like to show you this model of when we're talking about content, what exactly we're talking about. In fact, we're talking about clinical knowledge captured in the guidelines and peer review publications in best practices documents from which we, in informatics, extracting the specific scenarios, we call them uh, use cases, and that's how the workflow of those um, um, uh, care management processes are described, and the information flow is also described, and the elements of this information um, specified, and they all this consist of this data set. Sometimes it's just words, sometimes it's images, sometimes it's readings from the medical devices, and all eventually get into those coded values, numbers that machine can read. What do we have today to enable semantic interoperability? And this is the next slide that's showing you that today through the clinical documentation improvement program, coding and data analytics, this continuum of translating clinical knowledge into machine readable text, in fact, is already in place. We just need to work together to better uh, understand what is the specifics uh, that needs to be communicated from the clinician perspective to the clinical documentation uh, um, and into the machine-readable process of this documentation. On the next slide, you will see that from healthcare, uh, from HIM perspective, the uh, content managers that we need to support these activities are specialists in vocabulary and terminology services, that are coders, clinical documentation improvement specialists, those who are developing today clinical pathways, documents, and case definition templates. And this is the data analytics people who just work in today with you to validate your content as well as um, um, supporting overall operation. Uh, analysis of deploying electronic medical records. On the next slide, I, will show, I would like to show you that the same concept of content management applies here to the functional interoperability because the rules of managing content is what we call information governance in health informatics are truly applied to that particular um, um, enabling enabler of this semantic and both functional interoperability. Information governance on the next slide, as you can see, is something that uh, makes uh, rules uh, explained to the information systems so that information could be available, protected, transparent, integral, accountable, compliant, retained in the right fashion and disposed as needed. For well, that kind of uh, activities, the specialist that we need on the next slide is the con uh, information governance specialist. This is the bridge of IT, informatics, and law specialist on information governance, e discovery, information brokerage, and consumer advocacy. These are the workforce that we need to focus on, both on 
helping uh, this workforce to be deployed in the health care organizations implementing electronic uh, health record technology, as well as those who will be helping us to build standards to enable this operation through technology. On the next slide, I would like to show you two initiatives that, in fact, are being focusing on providing this holistic vision of focusing on interoperability rather than continue to work on this pocket or experimentation mode. During the President Bush administration, you might remember that we had this Health Information Technology Standards Panel, which is in fact been working on developing so-called interoperability specification for the national use cases defined by American health informa informatics community. There were 152 of these national use cases problem list included. This work was stopped and right now we see actually on the international level at the ISO Technical Committee 215, the 52 national uh, member bodies of ISO decided that they would like to work on so-called health interoperability standards bundle. It's an aggregate of standards. Uh, that uh, allows end users to see what types of standards are needed for a specific healthcare domain. The next slide will show you the process of how interoperability standards are developed. You're proposing the use case. Remember the clinical scenario explained to standard developers. They define the requirements, workflow, and data flow, and information needs. They select standards. They develop this bundle. Reference standard portfolio, the working title right now under ISA, they test it. Absolutely critical um, piece here is to test those standards in order to then certify the product with the standards that are actually being successfully tested. And so those interoperability specifications or reference standard portfolios could be published. I would like to show you the next slide, which shows you the complexity of the interoperability standards development uh, methodology. There was this question here that Dr. Wright um, addressed of, will his approach, his study, uh, uh, be interoperable with HL7? It is not enough for Dr. Wright's study to be interoperable with HL7. If you look at the bottom of that um, list, the uh, study that Dr. Wright is uh, administering right now has to be interoperable with deployment of all these different types of standards to enable semantic, technical, and functional interoperability. If you go right now to the next slide, you will see that I just added one statement in this circle on the middle in red called Content tagging for specific healthcare organization is not enough. It should be done in standardized fashion. And this knowledge that we learned today from Dr. Wright and Dr. Schiff has to be translated to the standard development organizations that Hopkins will not repeat children's health path and don't need to wait another six years to be as successful as children. I would like just to finish this presentation with the last slide, which shows you basically the next steps that IHIMA is working on. I'm inviting you to join the development of interoperability standards at ISO Technical Committee to 15 Health Informatics. And I also invite you to work with us to build this workforce for interoperability. There is a global competencies for HIM, informatics, and health IT that's been developed by IHIMA Foundation together with the global community. And we begin building uh, partnerships with the academic programs, for example, at Hopkins, to train content managers, both on the HIM side as well as clinical side, as and information governance specialists for interoperable health IT solutions. Thank you so much. Anna, thank you. I think we all learned a thing or two or three from your presentations. Very interesting. We have time for just one question, and here it is. So in the quest for interoperability standardization, is there still a place for the unstructured kind of data that Dr. Schiff so loves, the, the rich note that conveys the thinking about a patient? Absolutely. 
and the the more um, information standard developers and then and they are mostly represented by vendors could just get today from how the unstructured text should be represented how better use natural language processing how pair this with the structured data I think the more robust technical standards based solutions we will have at the end today all this um, two presentations that you've uh, you've heard before me in fact to me is the requirements for the interoperable health IT systems that I would like to take and work with the standard developers to make it actually happen. Anna, thank you, and I'd like to thank all our speakers for a terrific program today. I'd like to turn it back to Michael for some closing comments and instructions. Great, and, and actually, uh, thanks, Mark. This is uh, Jonathan Walls. I'm just going to close and uh, again thank thank uh, uh, Dr. Schiff, right, and, and uh, Dr. Orlova. Uh, thank all the attendees. This slide has two things that I wanted to share. One is that our next webinar is planned for uh, August, and um, I think we actually are just now confirming that it'll be on August 20th, 1 to 2:30. Um, more details to come. And the second is that our September webinar, which does not have a date yet, is going to focus on the Health IT Safety Center roadmap um, itself, which is the, the project under which these webinars are, um, are being offered. Um, and the, the focus for that meeting um, is really going to be to discuss the proposed National Health IT Safety Center. And if we can just go to the next slide, please. Um, this is just a, a preview of um, some of the areas that we expect will be covered in September, the need for a National Health IT Safety Center uh, development process, um, the idea of a proposed public-private partnership, and a discussion about the center goals, activities, operations, and, fund and funding. So we're, we're just um, in the planning phase for this right now, but um, I wanted to make sure that both August and September webinars, um, our uh, information is, is shared today, and, and that will be available uh, to you through the website. So with that, um, I will uh, again thank everybody, um, thank uh, you all for attending, and, um, and wish you all a, a terrific afternoon. Bye-bye, everyone.